Hello and welcome to Procedural Workflows in Production. Today I'm going to talk about how Houdini was used to create Project Titan and show you new procedural workflows. I'm Simon Verstraten and I will show you more about this. Before we start, a little bit about me is I was a couple of years ago studying digital arts and entertainment. In the last year we had to do the graduation project, which was for me searching Houdini and also getting in touch with procedural workflows. So that was the first time using Houdini and doing things uh, in procedural approaches. Then I joined an in Studio Exon, where they also start to use Houdini to do procedural things. And from that, I also started to make tutorials and blog posts uh, to share more about Houdini. And then later on, I started working together with side effects. And that's sort of what I'm currently at, is making learning content, making tutorials, demos, and things like that to help people learn more about Houdini. So the topics I will talk about today, we have three bigger topics. I will just show you the results or introduction to Project Titan. I will so I will share then a making of on how Project Titan was built over the a timeline. And then I will go a bit more in depth into how of these tools are now actually built. Now let's start with an introduction to Project Titan. What now is exactly Project Titan? I'm gonna immediately already here show our trailer. So that was the result of Project Titan. So Project Titan sort of like we had three major parts that we always wanted to push. So we have a learning part, procedural workflows, and focusing on how artists would build or use these tools. So for the learning part, so most tools that we that I will show you here or that you might already have seen will come later with a tutorial. So we are currently building these tutorials for you. These tutorials can go from advanced to a bit. Uh, more beginner friendly approaches so there will be a variety for everyone and also the tools will be will be available when the tutorial com can come out you will also be able to play around with the tools as well of course then showing off procedural workflows so this is the idea of course to generate content how can we make something faster without having that without having to go to manual uh, tweaks and and changing everything in a manual way. On Project Titan, we mainly focused on world generation and asset generation. So a lot of the things that I will show you here will involve around, for example, a building tool to faster make the world or asset tools to faster make, for example, a prop in the scene and things like that. And of course, this will focus on Houdini. So a lot of the most of the things I will show you here will be for Houdini using, using the power of Houdini and so on. So in later stages of this presentation, it's recommended if you have some understanding of Houdini, that will be uh, helpful uh, to get the most out of it. Then also artist-friendly workflows. So how do artists use tools? What can they do for them? Uh, and also the benefits of them. This will be touched on in a moment a bit more, uh, but that's also like 
an important thing to think about since we are giving them the tools to actually build the scene. So they need to be comfortable with that. And as you can see here again, this is our results. This is the scene that we end up building. The scene actually took around two months of building. So what you see here was two months of time. And this was in total built with three artists. So one full-time and two part-time artists. We also built a couple of tools with that. So here are a few examples. So we have like foliage tools. Uh, we have like cables and pipes. We can, for example, have automatic stacking of objects. And we, of course, for example, have the building tool. So we have roughly around 20 different tools for Project Titan. Later, I will share more about that. Uh, but for now, uh, these are just some examples. With that, let's also look at some industry examples. So what we have built at Titan is something that you can already do today with Houdini. If you would use Houdini now in your project, you will be able to do similar things. So let's already look at some examples of where they actually have been using Houdini to do uh, these things. First example here is the Ascent from Neon Giant, where they have also multiple tools. So here are a few of them. So we have like a tool for room making, pipes, cables, and they also use the destruction options in Houdini to, for example, destroy uh, parts of buildings and so on. Parts of Titan are also inspired by this game. So this is a really great example, and I can recommend you checking out more about them. Then we also have the Far Cry 5 uh, from Ubisoft. They focused a lot on the world building side of things. So they have an open world game where the terrain is being generated, generated by Houdini. The cliffs are also part of that. They also made biodomes. So they generate how foliage is behaving over the terrain. And they also have like things like road tools. So those are like a few points uh, that they created here. You can find out more about this if you are going to the side effects website, uh, to the learning section. And then we have talks and webinars. Uh, so you can find out more there as well. Then we have Spider-Man from Insomnia Games. They, of course, also have an open world game, but they, of course, focus on buildings. So they need to have a good building generator in place to make the buildings. They also have things like the road systems. They also generate data for uh, traffic that they could be used for other things. Uh, and also, for example, like prop scattering. So the artists don't have to place every single prop. They have like systems in place for that. Here as well, you can find out more about this on the website if you are interested in seeing how other studios are using uh, the power of Houdini. Now let's go into how artists can use the tools. And with that part, I want to give it to uh, Robert, who is uh, one of the artists on Titan. So I will hand it over now to him. Let's take a look at how artists use the tool in Project Titan. Hi, I'm Robert Schröer, and I'm currently a generalist at Industrial Light and Magic. I'm currently living in Vancouver, BC, Canada, and I work together with uh, an amazing team of artists on Project Titan. So in real life, as artists, we have a lot of distractions. You know, we were made to make art, but then suddenly we have to do groceries and wash the dishes and all kinds of things. And even if we get back to our computers and we can finally work on our art projects, uh, we are still confronted with things which keep us out of the flow. Things like repetitive tasks um, in our in our project, uh, we were confronted with making a lot of houses. So that would have been a very repetitive task if we would not have been using Houdini. And also some tasks which just generally take a very long time, like uh, placing cables and making them interact with its surroundings. And whenever you have to, you know, fix it, you wheeze up of your important models, you have to switch software and go back and, and change it up. And in our case, we were able to do a lot of this editing in inside of the engine already. And you now when you have to switch software, you confronted with re-importing and exporting and these kind of things, and they're all manual and they take time. And of course, the the favorite part is uh, to uh, when you switch your software, you are suddenly confronted with an entirely different keyboard layout, and that is very annoying. So my personal favorite one there is to when you are working in an un, in Unreal Engine for a long time, and then you have to suddenly 
I'll switch back to Maya because I, I personally like to use the right mouse button, hold it down, and then fly fly through uh, the environment. And when you try to do that in Maya, you're going to be taking a very deep dive into the Pi menus. But luckily, there is Houdini and Houdini Engine, respectively, and it will save us all eventually, but at least the ones who actually try it out. Um, as already said, uh, with the houses, we were able to stay inside of the engine when we wanted to make changes because we only had to change the input boxes and we had to rescale them and um, all our wall segments were adapting and um, that way we were able to, you know, don't leave the context, you know. And um, with the Dini engine, you're going to be controlling systems instead of individual assets which is also kind of a different way of thinking, but it keeps you more on a higher level when you're working on, on bigger projects. And that really helps to don't lose the feel for the environment and get stuck into tiny little details too early. And it's also a lot faster because as I already said, you're going to be controlling a system and not tiny little assets. And it's a lot easier to iterate on them because you have things like parameters, which you can change on the fly. And when you're creating tools for your projects, you can potentially reuse them or use them as a base for later projects. And of course, you can also have potentially more variation because um, you can basically plug in as many inputs as you want. When you're working with proceduralism, uh, it's always good to think of it in 80 to 20. So you're going to be building your base foundation um, with the HDAs and with the proceduralism. And once that is done, you can go in and you know tweak the parameters and change them up a little bit. Uh, in our case, uh, we had the platforms and the platform tool. And that one was really, really handy because we did not have to make um, very specific modular systems and hope that we're not having two crazy shapes to be able to use those modules. But we could just, you know, create input boxes, lay them out in the environment and let the HDA do all the work for us. And then we could go in and build on top of that system by, you know, placing decals of, of leaves and dirtying everything up with some puddles and to get some cool reflections and all these things which are more fun. And what's also cool about using HDAs and proceduralism in general is that you can get inspired by actually just letting the tool do something for you and then you just see what's happening. You know, some more of a experimental uh, kind of thing where you're suddenly confronted with something really interesting out of your system. In our case, that was uh, the pipe tool but there were actually two of them. Um, the one was a little bit more straightforward by using curves. And the other one you just put in a box and it gave you a very complicated pipe system. And that one was really interesting to also have very cool lighting scenarios happening there. So what does that all mean? Well, finally, you're gonna be having more control over your environment because you're dealing with systems rather than tiny little assets. And you're being more of a manager of the project and you, and you stay more on a higher level and not focusing on tiny little things. You, know, you can also think in bigger scale and therefore create more with even smaller teams if you're happy enough to have a tech artist in your team. And you can call yourself a wizard because you're using Houdini. And let's take a look at what it's like working with tech artists as an artist. Uh, make sure to understand that they are your friends and they actually want to help you and they do not want to confuse you. So when they are giving you tools, um, make sure to <laughs> obviously use them, but also make sure to give them feedback on how you feel about them and how the functionality is and if there are more obvious things like bugs or if you have some some ideas for better user experience. And 
what's also really interesting is to build visual prototypes if you have ideas for tools, because that helps the tech artists to um, to understand what you are actually looking for. So in our, in our case, I was building a visual prototype of the of the um, platforms and gave those to the tech artists, and they were able to make a procedural system out of them. And also make sure to stay in close contact with your tech artists because um, and not just for giving them feedback, but also checking on them, like, you know, how, how are they doing and what are they currently working on so that you're staying in a little bit more of a friendly relationship with them. And it's also it's probably something more for tech artists. It's also really good to uh, think about making decent tutorials um, for your artists so they are not entirely confused when you give them a new HDA and they drop it into the scene. They don't know what to do with it. Uh, in our case, um, Simon made a lot of tutorials for us. So whenever we we got a new HDA, we also got a new video on how to use it. So as a conclusion, um, I never really used 2D Engine before. Uh, before this project, I only ever used uh, were creating things inside of Houdini and exporting them. Uh, but now I don't really want to work without it anymore because it's just so straightforward and the, the usability of it is pretty much endless. You know, every single time you're doing something which is really repetitive, you're thinking, huh, how could I transform that into an HDA maybe? Um, I definitely loved working with the team. I had a great time. It was sadly not that long of a project, but yeah, definitely enjoyed working with the with the people. And also something I hear a lot is that Houdini is very scary. Um, it's not scary. <laughs> uh, it's definitely worth um, stepping stepping over the fear and just trying it out and watching some tutorials. Uh, thanks for listening and back to Simon. Thanks Robert for talking more about how artists use his tools. Next topic is um, the making of Project Titan, going into a bit more detail on how this project actually was created. And with that, I'm going to use a timeline for that. So I'm going to use beginning, middle and, and the late stages of 2021. There are three bigger stages, I would say, where something happened or something changed uh, and then defied uh, how the project looked. So let's start with the beginning. This was more the ID phase. So here was just creating IDs. So of course, the early ID is that we want to build a larger learning demo. We wanted to share something with multiple tools that contained multiple tutorials. So usually if we do a tutorial, it's like, we build a certain tool and then we do a tutorial, but now we want to do multiple tools and combine that into a larger scene. For a team and story, we also set a futuristic version of Amsterdam. That was something from the beginning already there that we wanted to go with. And in terms of story, we had like a little story going on where robots would play a huge part in society. Uh, and that would be like a small story around that. Back then, we also had the idea of doing a CGI part and a real-time part. So we would do like a cinematic in CGI where we would render it out in Houdini and we do like a real-time part where we build things with Unreal, for example. Then with those first ideas came also the first concepts. So we're just visualizing how that could already look like. Uh, here we have, for example, also sort of like a storyboard with that as well, since we had the idea for that cinematic. So we had, like, for example, our main character would wake up in an alleyway. He would then walk through the city, explore the city, learn about how the robots behave in, in the city and so on. Uh, and then also later in that cinematic, we would then sort of like see like the dark side of things in the world with the robots. So that was like very roughly a story that we had with like some first visuals. Now, also in terms of like first tools that are being built, uh, the building tool was something that from early stages already started to be uh, building and exploring that. We also had things like the pipes, cables, wall, and pavement tool. Uh, so some of these tools did not make it until, until the end, but there were some just like early tests to see what could be interesting to build already. 
We are also using assets like Megascans and Kitbash. So we are a very small team at that point. We don't necessarily have already like external artists and internally we only have a few people uh, who have who have some time uh, to build a few things. So of course having something like Megascans and Kitbash to make sure that we don't have to build every asset was like a great way to go from the start. Then we move over to the middle of 2021. Here we are doing some more research. So our scope, first of all, changed. Um, so we decided to not do the CGI part anymore. So we break up that ID and I focused then personally more on like making a real time uh, example or demo. With that also came a bit redefining the scene. How could the scene look like? And we also then built a block out with that. So we had Chase Hardy. Uh, who is a level designer who blocked out a level for us. This was already like a great playground or testing ground for tools. So I could already start using the building tool or other tools here and experiment, and experiment with them uh, to see how they could work on this skill. So by that stage, uh, we built multiple tools. So you can see it's quite a lot of them. So they can go again from like updating the building tool to having new scaffolding tools, stairs, road tools, PDG optimization, and so on. I also then took a part of the block out. So here I just cut it out part of that Unreal block out and I started to add some tools. So I had the idea to make like one big tool that could generate a lot of different things. Like it would generate the buildings, place trees, place some roads, place some other elements on the city. Uh, but in the end I decided to not go in that route and split up into smaller tools. Uh, so this is always like a balance between how much should be user controlled versus how much should be generated or automated. So that's always like a balance you need to find. So in this stage, I felt doing doing too much for the artist might take away their control um, of, 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 of using the tools how they would like it to see. Then we move over to the later stages of 2021. So here we actually start to build the scene. So first of all, uh, our scope changed. And the main reason for that is by the end of the year, we wanted to show something. We all, so we only had like uh, three or four months left. Uh, and we just wanted to show something by the end of the year about this project. So we decided to take a part of the scene and, and use that as sort of like a visual target to have it as at high fidelity. So with that came also then a concept stage. So we had Lino on board making a couple sketches for us. So here are some of the sketches. The sketches are mainly meant for supporting the environment artists. So they then know how to sort of like figure out how certain things are structured and built. Um, so that was, was really helpful for them to already have like a, a good idea on how things uh, could look like. Here are also, for example, some robot sketches where we can see we actually built the boat and the pizza bot. Those two are in the scene. Then in terms of tool, a couple new tools. So we have like uh, a lot of foliage tools. We have the platforming fences, billboard ads, trains, and the VAT characters. So here are just like a couple more tools of that. Uh, and of course, polishing tools. So at this stage, we also decided to only finish or polish the tools that we had time for. So that's why we ended up with those 20 uh, tools. Then about the actual scene uh, creation. So we had roughly around two months uh, of time to build the scenes. This was in October and November. We had then three artists uh, on board who would be able to help with that. So we had like one artist uh, full time, which was Robert and then Leah and Max part time, uh, sort of like more helping and supporting Robert uh, in, in what he would need for the scene. Uh, so by then most tools are actually already in place. So, the mo so a lot of them, uh, they could just like drag and drop and, and it will work. And also we had weekly meetings to sort of like follow up the process and, and talk with the artist if they need any specific needs in terms of tools and so on. So of course the week one example here is just making a block out. And also importantly with that is then also planning and referencing. Uh, so this is a mirror board and here we gathered all the concept art with some additional references if the artist would need to. And we also started planning out very roughly uh, the stages and in the, in the upcoming week. So we only had like a few weeks time to build the scene. So there was a lot of like planning and 
uh, and, and searching for um, for reference and so on. This is then, for example, in the middle of the project. This is already week four. Uh, so you can already see that there's a decent amount of progress. A lot of tools have been deployed here. So all the buildings have been done very quickly, cables, pipes, uh, defenses. So using these tools very quickly, we were able to then uh, get like first visuals and idea of how this could look like. And then after week eight, uh, we then sort of like have the final result where everything came together to this one uh, image here. So quickly uh, summing up what sort of like happened that year is in the beginning stage, this was mainly the ID and setting a team story and also defining the first scope. Then moving over to the middle stages of 2021, we're then more uh, looking out for tools like re researching and developing tools. Uh, also assembling a team at this, we were already like looking for team members uh, and looking for people to help with us. And we changed also the scope. So we focused on the real time part and in the late stages. We then decided to, we need to build something uh, for the end of the year. So that's when we actually start to build the scene with concept art and also polish up tools. I also want to mention that we did not work full time on this project. So. Uh, for example, I also did like other learning content and other learning demos during that time. Uh, but most of the work was, of course, done in like the later stages, as you could see. Like most of the work was actually done uh, in like the last months where we actually started to create the thing. Then let's take a deep dive into tools of uh, Project Titan. So already here is like a tool list of what tools have been built. So there are like roughly around 20 different tools. Um, and uh, the way I will approach it here is I will pick out a couple tools that have interesting things and talk a bit more about them. Uh, so here, let's start out uh, with defenses. So defense to itself um, is just like you draw a curve and it will make a fence. Like that's how it is for the artist. So that's how they would use it. Now, what actually happens, it will instance models, but it will always uh, generate unique corners. So here we have, for example, a unique corner piece. So that is a uniquely generated geometry specifically tied to that angle uh, of the curve. And the reason for that is when I generate a new geometry piece, that means I can basically cover any angle. So here you can see like four different situations where the angle or the corner piece is perfectly fitting into the instancing pieces. So that's the reason why I decided to make new geometry pieces there. So we can always like have a good result, whatever the artist is doing. And I also want to share a breakdown of the process. So this is an overall process of how you could build the tool from the final output. I'm specifically going to here use the fence tool, but I will talk about other things as well here. Uh, just to you have like an overall idea on what it actually take from building the tool to then finding the output to your final project. So I'm going to go over the steps of actually building the Houdini tool, making then the Houdini assets, then using Houdini engine to import it into the game engine. Then we're going to talk about input since we, for example, want to control the tool by curves or other shapes. And then we're also going to talk about the final output or baking process. So when I finally would release or publish my game, we want to, of course, bake our output so they're not like Houdini tools in the project. So let's start by looking at how tools are built. So here is an example again from the fence tool uh, where this starts from a curve. So the main tool or the main interaction is with a curve based system. So I'm going to just also start from a curve here. Then I will bevel the curve so we don't have the hard edges anymore. So the, so the curve itself also is like a basic linear curve. So we can just uh, quickly bevel the edges there. Then I want to make a group that is able to split those two parts. So I have a primitive group uh, that contains the beveled parts and a primitive group that sort of that contains the straight lines where there were no beveling going on. So let's talk a bit about how the straight parts work. So here we have like the straight lines. And what I will do here is I will grab my uh, model, my fence model, and I want to evenly space it out along the lines. So the first step here 
is to find out how many times can my model fit into the curve. This can easily be done by a resampling node. And the resample node will basically then create points uh, evenly distributed along the curve, as you could see here. So once that is in place, uh, we calculate the middle of the line. And this is basically then the instancing location or the pivot point of the model. So on each point will then be a copy of the modular fence part. What is important here is also adding rotations. So we need to add the little rotation information about how they should be placed uh, on the points. So we're going to copy the model on the point, but they of course need to have the right rotation value. So when we do that, we can now see that everything is copied in the right rotation. Uh, and of course, you can play around with some scaling values to properly scale them in those parts. So that's like how you could uh, do that. Now, the other part is then, of course, uh, the corner pieces. So we're going to extract that corner line from the bevel. And now how can we now add that geometry? So in my case, I make uniquely generated geometry. And a very quick way on doing that is you load in your modular fence and then you just use the chain node. With that, you can see that automatically it will sort of like deform that modular fence onto the curve. So we'll create this nice result by default. Now, one little issue here is that the orientation is not properly done. Uh, so that's something that I have to look into. But at this stage, I already have given out the tool to the artist. So they could already use the tool, even though I know it was like not perfect in the corners. But this was something, of course, that I fixed later on. So I I'm not afraid to like give out artist tools, even though it might not be 100% perfect. Um, so I know that this will come back and uh, will be will be tweaked. So then a few days later, then I implemented a, a fix for the rotation. So I used uh, some information about the node called orient along curve, which can calculate the orientation values along a, a specific curve. And then I can use that data to sort of align those pieces better. So that's sort of like how that work here. So there's just an example of I'm not afraid to give out tools even though like some parts might not be fully working correctly yet, uh, but it's just to see if artists are already liking the tools. Do they already feel comfortable using that tool or did you already maybe have other ideas for that tool? And then we basically then uh, have a result like so. So we instance the parts that are just straight because they don't need any deformation and the corners again are uniquely generated geometries uh, to fit any type of corner. Then it comes over to making the digital asset. So we are going to collapse all the structure that we built into one single tool. So by now you actually have the logic on how to generate this fence, for example. But now we want to collapse it into one single tool. Uh, and of course, we are calling this a digital asset in Houdini. So with this, we can create our own interface and menus and parameters. So here on the images, you can see the parameters that you were able to use the tool. So you can see it's also not that uh, expanded or they are not that crazy amount of values you could play around with. There are just very basic values on how many fences uh, should there be. Like this basic values can controls a bit how many times the fence can be placed. We have like some scaling values with that. We also have some options to meet, to either disable or enable the corner part or for example tweak the bevel amount of the corners. And we can also use instancing and we can use multiple instances. Uh, so the tool can randomly pick instances uh, so we have like more variation. So it's always finding the balance between how much sliders or options should I provide versus what is actually needed or versus what maybe could be more interesting in doing in a bit more automatic way. So this is often a discussion you would have to have with the artist and, and see if they actually like the tool or, or see maybe if they feel maybe limited about certain parts. So of course this can be like thing, this can be something that can go back and forward. Uh, but I ended up here with like a very basic menu uh, in the end for this uh, case. Then we're going to go over to using Houdini Engine to bring our tool inside of Unreal or for example Unity as well. So these are a couple things that uh, I would like you to keep in mind when you're doing this. So we have mainly two parts of bringing data in Houdini Engine. So we can either use instances or we can use geometry. So those are like the two most common things you want to do. 
So either you send out point clouds, which hold instancing data, or either you just send out full geometry that you generated into, uh, for example, Unreal. So with instancing, what is important is we need to set an attribute called Unreal Instance, and that would define uh, what is the actual instance. So you can see here on the image, it's just similar for the material. So here it's called Unreal Material. But what is important here is we actually need to set the path on where to find that uh, object that we want to instance or want to set. So here at the bottom of the slide, you see like this string value and you have like set instance from game, this folder, this folder. So this just contains the path on what assets to use. You can quickly get paths or references by just right clicking in Unreal and get a copy reference. So that's quite quickly done. So when you set an instance, what is also important to know is to also set scaling. If your scale would for some reason be zero, then of course you will not see your models because you scale them with zero. And then you, of course you need to set the rotation value so your actual rotation of instances are correctly done. Then if we go over to the geometry part, uh, we can also, for example, here set materials. So when we open uh, our tool and it generates geometry, we have automatic materials assigned to it. We can, of course, do multiple material IDs and so on, but that's something that just can be done automatically. Uh, other things that we might want to keep an eye out for is handguns. By default, there will, be, of course, be some process to um, get rid of handguns, but it might be interesting that you sort of like look into that yourself to have um, no surprises uh, in game engines. Uh, we also have like normals. Uh, so by default, there will be some default normal importing values, but it can be a good idea to just place the normal node and actually calculate the normals to what you would like to see. And we can also do collisions. Uh, you can have some automatic collisions with Houdini. Uh, you can have some custom collision generation with Houdini, uh, but you can also just rely on like the automatic collision systems of Unreal. So that's fully up to you if you want to make something very specific with Houdini or just rely on, for example, in the real collision system uh, to generate collision there. So those are just like a couple points that you might want to keep in mind when handling with instances uh, and geometry. Then our tool sort of like perfectly works in Houdini engine, but we still want to control it with curves or inputs. So my fence tool specifically will be controlled by a curve. So I can just draw a curve in game engine. And here on the image, you can see that we have like a special menu for inputs. So we can actually input a curve. Uh, so by doing so, it will just use the basic curves uh, splines from uh, Unreal. Uh, if you're already familiar with that, it's just like a very basic curve system. So we can just draw that curve. But of course, when we talk about inputs, we, we don't only want curves. We also want other things like we can also do things like landscapes or actually pick objects from a scene. So you can do multiple things. So you're not only limited to curves, so you can do a variety of things. So for example, the building tool works by inputting other cubes. So if you place cubes in the scene, it will actually use those cubes uh, to generate the building. So we actually, instead of using curve, we then use the world outliner and start picking parts or, or objects from the world. Then we come to the last step, which is baking. So currently my tool is working and I have a result that I would like to have in my final game. So when we have that, it's recommended to think about baking. So we can either bake uh, instances or static meshes. So here on the image you see, we are just basically baking out static meshes. So newly generated geometry will be converted into static meshes into this folder. So you can see here that this can go, so you can see here on this image, this can go from like some of the foliage parts to cables, to the pipes, to the fences, to a variety of things that we need to bake out. That's very important to know. Now for the user who is actually then using the tool, it's like a very simple option for them. They just need to press the bake button in the tool. So there will be just like a bake button and then, and it will just like bake out two static meshes or if it's only instances, or if it's only like pure instancing, then it will just output an instancing or even just a blueprint with instances. So it's, it's pretty straightforward in the menu. Now, when we talk about uh, using GitHub, there might, there might be something interesting here to keep in mind. 
So the baking process, or just using Houdini engine in general, has two folders for this. So if you look into Unreal, you will have the Houdini folder, and under the Houdini folder, you will have the bake folder and the temp folder. So whenever you load in a tool and you would play around with it, it will store the data into the temp folder. Now, when you then actually press the bake button, it will actually then store the data in the bake folder and will actually output static meshes and so on. So why is this important to know is for Project Titan, the temp folder was on Git Ignore. This was not something that was pushed to GitHub. The reason for that is again, every time I open a tool, use a tool, or import again new tools, they will store data into the temp folder. So if you're someone who like uses and builds a lot of tools, this folder can quickly go up in size over time. And either way, this is like a temporary folder. So the data that is in here might be interesting, might not that be interesting over time. And sometimes might just be interesting to clean out this folder if this would be getting large in size. So I recommend everyone who is like using the tools, if you have something that looks interesting, bake out the result in the bake folder and then push the bake folder to GitHub so everyone can see the result. That also means that if we bake out the results, we're not longer relying on Houdini engine anymore. So if you're, if you are working in a larger team with a few hundred people, not everyone needs to have Houdini or Houdini engine installed. As long as it's baked out, it basically is now baked out to a static mesh. So it's not necessarily needed to have Houdini or Houdini engine. So they can just directly preview the baked out results. So that's something to just maybe keep in mind if you are thinking about that. I also want to mention a different couple of cases. So here are four uh, two points. I just want to talk about different tools that might have some interesting things uh, for you to know about. So we have something about world building, simulation, vertex colors, and not using Houdini engine. So in terms of world building, we had uh, our building tool. And of course, like it, it just like in, uh, has boxes as input. And from those boxes, it will then place the motor models on the sides. What is interesting here that this is using data tables. So data tables is basically sort of like a long list of data that could be used for the tool. So here you can see on this list, we had like more than 40 different models for the tools. And then this will then be imported with Houdini so the tools know how or what to use as models. So this is mainly useful if you're just dealing with a ton of data. Uh, so here, like, like you see, like there are just a ton of modular models for the buildings. And then in Houdini Engine, I can do some automatic filtering there. So instead of the artist having to, for example, manually uh, drag and drop assets into the tool, I just automatically get this list or this data table and then basically when the artist says that they need, for example, a certain style, like style A or style B, I will filter on what is needed for to create that style. And another thing is about uh, simulations. So Houdini is quite known for its simulation options and abilities. And we can also you benefit from that using Houdini Engine. So here's, for example, a clot. So we can make a tool with a clot solver inside of it. And then we can actually simulate cloth falling on objects. So the tool, what we'll basically do is it will actually calculate a simulation of cloth falling down for around two or three seconds, for example. And then it will output that single frame into a static mesh to then actually just see a cloth on a object, for example. This way we can get some high fidelity cloth results uh, directly in uh, Unreal. This also is, for example, used with cables. So we can, for example, let the cables fall down into the ground. This will, then, this will then look like a very natural cables falling into the ground. Then another thing is vertex colors. Uh, so when we use colors in Houdini, this will then, of course, be imported as vertex color. And you can use this in multiple different ways, especially, of course, with shaders. Um, so here for the foliage tools, we, for example, use the red channel uh, to store the weight of the wind. So you can see that the tip of the leaf has like a higher value of the red. So that actually has more wind intensity on like the tips of the leaves. We can also, for example, generate a random value on each single leaf. And this can then be used for other things. This can be used for having more random wind values, or they could just be used for having random color values. So we have more variation with that. 
And of course, we can then start combining masks. So the red channel is the wind, the green channel is like color variation. And I can also just do something with the blue channel, store other information there as well. So this is just an example of the foliage, but you can do this in multiple different ways. Calculate some complex data in Houdini, store it in the vertex, and then in the shader, get back that data and then do something special with that. Then a couple things of tools that did not uh, go through Houdini Engine. Uh, I'm gonna here start out by the tree tool, which is uh, using the Pivot Painter version 2. So this will actually output a mesh and a couple textures for the Pivot Painting data. This will not necessarily go through Houdini Engine. It would have been, uh, it's definitely possible to use Houdini Engine for that, but I, just, but I decided to just generate a few versions for the artist and then just, they can just pick out what they would like uh, in the project. Then we have the procedural train and the procedural rig system. This was something that is mainly done in Houdini and I just exported it in the FBX file and then imported it uh, as, a, as a normal animation. In the future it might be possible that we actually also support uh, skeletal meshes imports directly to Houdini engine. Uh, I just did it also this way uh, it was also very easy to then have the animation files and overwrite them and so on. Then we also have the smoke and flip books or spreadsheets. I just make like a small, simple smoke simulation in Houdini and then use the new uh, labs flip book tools to then generate uh, the result that you see here and import that uh, and use that in, in materials and particles. Then we also have the characters built with vertex animations. Uh, so all the characters you see in the scene are uh, using the vertex animations. So they are not like your normal skeletal meshes uh, characters walking around. They are just actually vertex animation textures, so they don't use bones. They are basically a, a geometry with a fancy shader that moves uh, the geometry. So that's how that works. Uh, so we can quickly get a lot of them in, in one single place. I also did some shader tricks here to, for example, add random colors or a random style to the character. So we have like multiple different uh, characters quickly. And here we are back again at the tool list. So I only picked out a couple tools that were more interesting to show here. And I talked a bit about that as well. If you want to know more about all the tools, I can recommend checking out our website, which I will also at the end uh, mention a bit more. Uh, but here I just picked out a couple tools that were a bit more interesting to talk about some of the aspects about. So if I would now take a handful of tools and place them on the scene, and you can already see like a lot of things that are in the scene are built by tools, especially like looking at the buildings, they're all done by tools and all the details around that, they are all done uh, by tools. So bigger chunks of the of this scene are actually made by tools. So these are only only a few of the tools that we have here. And now let's talk a bit about the conclusion. So I'm pretty overall, I'm pretty happy with the result. It's, it's, I think it's a great result that we have built during that time, especially with the smaller team size. Like we did not like have a very large team for building the scene. We also had a lot of iteration on tools, but also on the scene itself. Like there were multiple stages where uh, the scene had iterations uh, for example, we can quickly change the buildings, we can quickly change how cables look and so on, like there were a lot of options for iteration there. Then we have, of course, uh, talking a bit about artist controls versus how much should be generated and, and, and automated. This can always be an interesting thing to think about. Um, since we, of course, wanted to focus on giving as much control to the artist, we ended, we ended up using making smaller tools uh, with like a few controls about it so the artist can just pick the tool that they, that they would like to use and then generate uh, their results with it. Then not all tools made it until the end. So as you might have seen from previous slides, uh, there were a lot of different tools that were researched and built, but not every single one made it until the end or, or did not have enough time to like really polish it up in like a very usable state for uh, the final stage. Then I quickly want to touch on sort of like tech issues. Not that we really had like technical issues, but I just want to talk a bit more about uh, Houdini and Unreal here. Uh, so in terms of Houdini, 
um, we do not have that many issues. Uh, we went, of course, to like uh, updating Houdini and Houdini Engine a few times during that year, uh, since there were uh, improvements on Houdini and Houdini Engine that made uh, the tool building better. Uh, but at the last month of uh, making the project, when we, act when we actually started making the scene, we locked down the Houdini version. So everyone uh, building something for us would use the same Houdini version and the same Houdini version of Houdini Engine. So that was something just to make sure that everyone is like on the same line there. Then in terms of Unreal, so we used Unreal 5 Early Access. And of course we used things like Lumen and Nanite. So often now we got asked by how much, for example, Nanite do we use. So here is a shot of that. So you can see that a lot of the parts that you actually see in the scene do use a Nanite. And this helped a lot. So at early stages, we did not start use Nanite. We did not really think about it too much. We just built a scene like we would normally do in like, for example, Unreal 4. But at a certain point, we noticed that there was definitely a performance impact after a few weeks of building this scene. Uh, one of the first ideas that I had to see if, if it would make a difference is enabling Nanite. And that definitely made a difference. That definitely gained, gave us back multiple frames uh, on the scene and then made everyone like enjoy working more on the project since we they had this, the project was running way more smoother. Then we also of course used uh, Lumen, so the real-time lighting, so everything you see is in real-time lighting. And what we did with Lumen is we toned down a couple settings. So Lumen was something that was some in some cases a bit more heavy, especially the um, virtual shadow maps. So we well, while we were building the scene, we actually disabled or turned down a couple settings here and there uh, to make sure it's like not that heavy on, on, on everyone's computer. So also not, not everyone also had like a very fast system to build the scene on, had to tone a couple of values to make sure everyone had like decent frames to, to start building this. And now to finally round up this talk, a couple of things left that I want to share is the tutorials. So I mentioned in the beginning that we will come out with tutorials. I will mention it here at the end as well. So in the upcoming days and weeks, you might see more and more tutorials coming out. This can go from like a beginner to an advanced level. Uh, we will also include a demo project, demo files for everyone to try out in the future. Uh, but we, we will want to first, of course, release more tutorials and then uh, we will we will uh, show a bit more demo projects. So where can you find all this information is on the actual sideeffectswebsite.com/titan. This page will contain all of the information about Titan. It will contain a couple of videos about uh, Titan and its process, but it will also contain videos about the different amounts of tools and tutorials here for Project Titan. Then also SetFX Labs. Uh, so this is a free tool set for everyone to use in Houdini. And Titan did also a couple of things here for that. Uh, so a couple of tools got updated, like building tool, cable tool, and a new new couple new tools like instancing tool and pivot painting tool uh, was sort of like also added. So we had like a small role here as well into like the labs uh, tools where a few tools got updated and a few new tools got added. So that's just overall interesting to know, especially if you if you never have tried out the lab tools, definitely check them out. There's a lot of great stuff in there for you to try. And then of course, thanks to the team. So we had a production team. So we have like the environment artist who worked with us for a couple months on building the scene. We also had a couple of Dini artists who worked on multiple tools. So these are all the people I want to thank for helping and contributing to the project. And of course, I want to thank you as well for watching this presentation. Thank you.